Morning everyone. Again, I don't think it's the right day to talk about irrigation because it's all wet outside, but um, this is what we're going to do, talk about water. And uh, so I was asked to give a presentation, a general presentation on methods and tools that are available for scheduling irrigation. And I kept this pretty general as an overview of what we have out there and uh, in a, a, what are the pros and cons of the different tools and the different methods. Um, so this is uh, just an outline of the things I'm going to talk about. So we'll review a little bit of the basics of uh, uh, crop water use in general for um, giving you um, some background. And then uh, uh, I'll describe a little bit how we measure the actual evapotranspiration in the field setting. Um, and then we'll move to the core part, which is method and tools that are available for scheduling irrigation in our site-specific conditions. And finally, uh, we'll try to point out what are the advantages of one method and the other and drawbacks. And in my view, water is going to be somehow a an issue in the near future. So I think uh, there's... a uh, out there the technology and the knowledge do a good job from the water side and the again the energy side so um, moving into the general part what really drives the crop water use which we call evapotranspiration is a combination of evaporation from the soil and from the canopy and transpiration through the canopy is the solar energy so a plant this this uh, Crop ET is a process that needs energy, and the plant receives energy from the sun. So the, this solar energy, when it arrives at the, at, at, the, at the ground surface, some part gets reflected back into the atmosphere, and so it arrives and it doesn't reach the canopy or the ground, but is reflected back, and of course it's a small portion. And the other parts reach the soil, when it reaches the soil, it could be stored into the soil or it could trigger soil evaporation if the soil is moist, okay? And another part that it doesn't reach the soil but it's around the surface, it changes the temperature of the air. So these are all components, okay? We call this, when it changes the temperature of the air, we call sensible heat flux. When it changes the temperature of the soil, we call it ground heat flux. And, and, and of course, as I was telling you, if the soil surface is moist, there's some energy that gets lost because of the soil evaporation. And when the energy hits the plant, the plant stores that energy, and that energy is used for vaporizing water from the liquid state to the, to the vapor state. If everything I said is true, then it means that we can somehow measure this different component, the sensible heat flux, the ground heat flux, and we can measure also the reflected part of the uh, energy back to the atmosphere and get a good sense of how much is the energy that is available at the plant level to do this work of vaporizing water. Uh, this is a picture from my pistachio project in the San Joaquin Valley, but just to give you an idea. So the, the amount of energy that is used for this process of evapotranspiration, so to evaporate from the soil and transpire through the canopy, it's called LE, or latent heat flux. And as you can see here, uh, here is the uh, energy used to change the temperature of the, of the air or the canopy, and this is the ground heat flux. So we can determine this ET, or evapotranspiration, which is this part, by measuring the radiation that is available at the plant level and the change in temperature and the change in temperature at the air and at the soil. So this is what we do normally in research setting, in, in field condition, to, uh, to measure the actual evapotranspiration, the amount of water. So we, we use normally an energy balance approach. And it's called the residual of energy balance because we measure net radiation, we measure ground heat flux, and we measure sensible heat flux, and we determine the ET by difference. So we don't measure latent heat flux, but we, we, we determine latent heat flux by 
difference between net radiation that we measure, the ground heat flux that we measure, and sensible heat flux that we measure. All right? So it's called the residual of energy balance. We don't do a water balance, so you can, you can determine the AT from the water balance point of view, but with micro-irrigated crop, because the redistribution of water with drip or micro sprinkler is not homogeneous, it's kind of a difficult and complicated. Also, there are different layers in the soil, so water might go down, and so it's a little bit more, uh, there's a, a more uncertainty to do in, in the, soil, uh, the soil water balance. So this residual of energy balance method, again, this is the equation. We measure the net radiation. The net radiation is the difference between the incoming solar radiation and the reflected. So what we measure here, the net radiometer, is the amount of energy, the net amount of energy that the plant has available for vaporizing water from the liquid state to the vapor state. And these are ground heat flux plates and, and, and soil temperature probe that we, we need for measuring the ground, uh, the, the G. And the sensible heat flux, we use two different methods. We use uh, uh, eddy covariance theory and surface renewal theory. There's a, there's a station that we installed last Sunday at Oakville that yesterday could not be accessed because it was all, um, all wet, but um, uh, we can we can provide a little bit more detail. This is what we do in, in research setting in order to measure what happened in that field, in the site specific conditions, with that type of canopy, with that type of rootstock, with that type of microclimatic conditions. All right? And these are pictures of different uh, research projects. This is in the Sierra foothills with Lynn Wunderlich. She's here. And as you can see, we got different instrumentation in the field. Of course, when we measure, the ET, we also want to know whether, what, what level of happiness the plant has, whether it's happy or less happy. So we normally measure also the plant water status with the leaf water potential or stem water potential. So we pressure bomb, basically. And, and this is, uh, again, research study. This is, this is what we installed with Khan at Oakville uh, in order to measure ET in a young, or, young vineyard. So in, in the case of grapes, because you know the, the ground cover is not homogeneous and it changes over the season, what really, uh, what really drives the, the, the amount of uh, um, water use is, is the energy that is intercepted by our canopy. All right? And th this energy comes from the sun, so there's direct radiation, but also comes from air, you know, warm air that moves across the canopy or wind or there's a, if our, uh, our, our vineyard is isolated in, in, in between other crops, there's, there might be mass of air coming. So those are all energy sources that contribute to that amount of energy that the plant will use to transpire water. And so the combined effect of this uh, direct radiation from the sun and energy that comes from the wind and energy that comes from, from air you know, uh, uh, determine the, 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 the divine water use. And this, assuming that, that the soil is moist. So there's no limitation in the soil. So everything works. It's like a continuum. And so there's a fluxus of water from, from the soil, from the root uptake, and then it goes into the atmosphere. And the plant somehow is happy because everything works. And, and by the way, it's not a, actually a loss. What we use in terms of water it's used to, to uptake also nutrient and to assimilate the CO2 in, in terms of carbon for vegetation. And, and so the water use is not a loss. It's a gain for the plant because it's the, the means through which the nutrients are absorbed through the leaf and, and the carbon is assimilated from the leaf to the rest of the plant. So there's a work that has been done. Larry Williams is here. He's been working um, for a different research project. And there's a work that shows that the ET, so the amount of evapotranspiration, is somehow linearly related with the canopy intercept, light interception, all right? And so when we do this, we also try to 
uh, do a, a, a measurement of a canopy light interception that goes together with ET in order to, to see whether uh, the plant uh, um, is uh, somehow intercepting more or less radiation. This was developed, I guess, on flat area. So we're testing whether there's an adjustment coefficient when we are in sloping area or different aspect for sure. But anyway, there's a piece of work that has been done and give you also an idea how the plant is uh, transpiring water based on the canopy light interception. So the canopy development, development over the years and over the crop season. So this is a, a simplified formula and it'll, it'll tell you that you know, the, the ET amount of water that is about to transpire without any stress, let's say what good water condition is a function, it's a linear function of the, of the, of the, the canopy size, okay? And here is a calculation example that uh, I, I just uh, run, but just to give you an idea, uh, but we don't have to spend uh, a lot of time uh, here. Anyway, for in California, I was reading uh, different reports to prepare this presentation. I've seen that in the past, uh, water used by, grape, by grapevine has been determined in several locations in California, from the Central Valley, the desert, and uh, the coast, and somehow, Grapevine needs anywhere between 16, 18 to 28 inches of water per season to grow and produce an economic yield. And when I say economic, it's something a little bit sophisticated because it, you know, economic yield are determined by the quality and by the quantity. So, and this are, the range is quite, quite broad because on the coast you have certain uh, fog and dew uh, or rainfall. So, is, is also a function of the different condition that you, you have. But anyway, it's, a, it's, a, it's clear that grapevine can take water from different sources. One is the, what is available in the soil at the end of the, the winter period when there's uh, rainfall, but also can uptake water that come from uh, in-season rainfall. And, and of course, what we apply uh, in terms of irrigation, but also fog and dew on the coast. Those, these are water that is in the air and, you know, and the plant can use it for a transpiring water. It, it doesn't come from the soil, it comes from the air and so somehow you have to account for it, otherwise you apply more water. So it doesn't come from the soil, but it's a, it's a source of water, right? So now moving into schedule, so once we somehow quantify the amount of water that our vineyard needs, the question is how to apply it. So when to apply it, how much to apply it, with what kind of frequency to apply it. So we got a whole range of possibility here. And, and when we talk about irrigation scheduling, normally we try to answer two questions. So the first one is when to irrigate. So when to start during the season and when to start over the course of the season. And normally for all the crops, most of the crops, with no water stress, that don't benefit from water stress, the criteria is that we should irrigate before the plant feels any water deficit. But this is okay for almond, probably alfalfa, and other crop that you know uh, don't benefit from water stress. In case of grapes, they, they might be beneficial. It might be beneficial to irrigate a certain level of stress because there's quality aspects that you know you, you have the best physiologist here probably will tell you the criteria much better than me. But there's a some some level of stress that is beneficial for the yield uh, quality and also for uh, other um, uh, crop production aspects. So how much water to apply? Again, in case of no stress for crops that don't benefit from stress. So you should apply the amount, of, the amount of water that the crop has used since the last irrigation or the last rainfall. Or in case of uh, crops like grapes that benefit from a little bit of the water stress, so we should apply a portion of maximum ET in order to maintain a certain level of water stress. Right? And the third question, this is complementary to the first two, is how to best apply the necessary amount of water to, to meet uh, uh, ET demand. And so we can have uniform application if the soil is uniform, the crop canopy is uniform over the, crop, over the, the block.
But I showed you yesterday an example where we have a lot of variability in the field, so we can apply uniformly or in a different way, size specifically. It could be different strategies. So people might apply frequent and very light irrigation during certain time for certain crop, or in other uh, area they can apply less frequently, but in order to push water into the uh, deep soil profile, like it happened in many gra grape growing areas. And so also the application rate of the volume has to be compatible, as I told you yesterday, with, um, with the soil infiltration rate and the storage capacity. Or we, 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 I give you the example also of the energy, the power rates, and so that is another uh, driver for the decision. Okay? So the, but the irrigation scheduling, if we do a good job, has a several benefits, and those are practical benefits. There's not, it's not very... Uh, virtual or theoretical. So first of all, you can increase the farm profit by lowering the cost of water and energy, and uh, you can increase the yield, or it can increase the, improve the production quality. You can control the vegetative growth in certain parts of the season in order to uh, reduce the pruning cost or reduce the need to re remove uh, short shoots and, and, and leaves. Um, but also you can improve the fruit quality and the value in areas where the market somehow um, uh, give a, a, a additional value to improve fruit, fruit quality. Uh, you can also do a good job in preventing somehow or mitigating the effect of frost or heat damage. And you know, with this climate variability and, and weather variability, there's a, there's a lot of uh, frequency in these events. Um, but also you can reduce the losses of fertilizers and other chemicals uh, by depercolation or if you have a sloping ground by uh, runoff or off-site uh, um, leaching, right? The methods. So what we have available out there are basically three methods. One is based on the weather condition, the other one is based on the soil moisture, and the third one is based on what the plant feels. And I uh, I, again, you got here the best physiologies. So the plant feels and integrates what is it in the soil and what it surrounds the plant because of the atmospheric conditions, right? So this is probably the, 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 one of the best ways to go because the plant feels what he has on his feet and what he has around his arms, okay? So the weather base, we basically, what we do, we either estimate or measure the crop evapotranspiration. This, this is the, uh, probably one of the most common method used, most common method used in the past also, and requires a lot of data, requires a lot of calculation, and somehow is becoming uh, important, but also uh, only for having uh, some kind of guidelines. A soil-based, you know, uh, it, you somehow keep track of what happens in the soil moisture over the crop season. And so you assess the soil water status and somehow you define a certain target to maintain over there. Uh, it's kind of equipment intensive because you have to have a lot of sensor out there. The sensor have to work and provide usable information. Otherwise, just a, a, another amount of data that you, know, you have to crunch in your in your brain, but it's also good for feedback. So after we do an irrigation, it's good to have a, some kind of feedback from the soil. So have we applied enough water? And that water has infiltrated to the level that we want. So it's kind of an important method. And then we got the plant base with different uh, tools and different methodology. Uh, again, you somehow, uh, uh, somehow assess the plant water status, what the plant feels in terms of water. And, and uh, somehow it's labor intensive because you have to do a lot of, a lot of uh, periodic measurement. And so, and, and uh, it's well established for some of the crop, but it's a little, a little bit less established for other crops. Um, in any case, to do a good job, you know, you have to have skilled uh, personnel on the ground uh, for doing all this. Uh, kind of measurements, whatever method you use, if you use ET or if you use soy moisture or if you use plant-based, those are three alternatives. But in any case, you have to ask skilled people on the ground. And the skilled people doesn't have only to uh, understand the logic, but also troubleshoot whatever it doesn't work. 
So, and it happens in the field that, you know, the soil moisture sensor get disconnected or uh, they're not providing um, uh, meaningful information or something like that. So, starting from the weather-based or ET-based schedule, uh, the basic criteria is somehow to determine in some way the crop evapotranspiration, either estimating or measuring or somehow predicting uh, and, and replenish the amount of water that the crop has used since the last irrigation. So th this is, uh, this is the, um, a classic method for uh, irrigation scheduling. You can use historical ET average. Uh, it could be crop ET or reference ET. Reference ET in California is related to grass. So a reference ET is the amount of water that is used by grass standard uh, grass surface without any limitation of water, nutrients, or in optimal agronomic condition. But also you need to have a crop coefficient, which is the adjustment coefficient that relates your crop water use with the water use of standard grass, right? So you need to have this information. Or you can use a real-time reference ET from CIMIS. CIMIS is a network of... Uh, uh, weather station throughout California. I think now they are 152, so they can give you real-time uh, information on what is the grass evapotranspiration. But again, you need the good values of the crop coefficient, so the, the adjustment coefficient for grapes or table grapes or raisins or, or whatever other crop you have. Or you can use forecast. There's a possibility for you to check the forecast for the next week. I use the forecast when I have to tell my uh, growers that collaborate with me, you know, how, how much to irrigate next week. And sometimes you need the forecast because people have to order water at the end of the week for the next week from the water district, okay? So if you're not independent and you rely on water supply from water district, then you need probably to order, okay? And again, you need the good value of crop efficient. Here is a historical, an example of historical ET. This is a, something that you can get from the uh, Cal Poly website. They calculated somehow the amount of inches per day per different crops in the different month. For some strange reason, grapes is not there. Wine grapes is not there. <laughs> because I think grapes is one of the most probably difficult crop to standardize. Because you have so many site-specific conditions. You have rootstock difference, variety difference, uh, uh, the strategy that you want to follow. So probably in order to pull themselves out of the burden, they didn't include grapes. Anyway, you got a lot of other information for other, for other crops. This is a historical reference CT that you can get from CIMIS. Again, they're stationed throughout California. Some of them are better than others. But anyway, you got, let's say, uh, California is divided in 10 zones. And in, for planning and somehow for irrigation scheduling, you can have a sense of, uh, if you choose, for instance, the zone number 10, for example, you get a sense of historically what is being uh, the, for the month of April or May, an average uh, ET, reference ET. And of course, you need crop coefficient. So there, there are a lot of crop coefficient information available. Uh, and some of them were developed in the Central Valley. Some of them were developed in other locations. So you have a sense, a rough indication of how to do the, the, the calculation. Uh, again, reference ET can come also from real time. You don't use the, the you don't use the historical information, historical average, but you can get every day the data from the CIMIS station you're close, or from another product that is called spatial CIMIS. So even if you are not close to a station, you can pick your location, and it's a kind of a broad, uh, um, continuous. Um, surface of data. So you, if you click on the location, you can get uh, the, the uh, real-time data from CIMIS. Okay? Uh, what I use is the National Weather Service for next week because my grower, can, they collaborate with my project. They have to order the water Friday. So normally I check this on, on, on Thursday night. And I see you, you can get a, a forecast for the ET for the next week every single day. It's called FRET. Uh, it's called uh, forecasted ET. You can see uh, uh, Tuesday, uh, sorry, Thursday, Friday. So every day you can get seven days in advance. And this is a reference ET. So you still need a crop coefficient over there, good information. So again, uh, all this method requires that you put together the two 
uh, data and come up with an estimate. Um, the question, there's a, one question is, can ET, evapotranspiration, use also to, beside the, determining how much to irrigate, can it be used to decide when to irrigate? It, to, to some extent, yes, because it's like our bank account. We take water, we take money every day up to a certain level. When we, we hit the level that is red, then we have to refill it, right? So the soil is, could be considered as a storage. It could work the same way, and so we, we call the checkbook method. And so somehow if we monitor what is in the soil, uh, when the soil reaches a certain level of depletion, then we refill it in some way. So this is a combination of ET and somehow the soil. And the, what we try to estimate in the soil is what the, the level of threshold for no deficit, okay? We call maximal allowable depletion. And the information that you need to have is somehow the routine depth of the crop, what kind of water holding capacity your soil has, and what is the percentage of that available water that you don't want to exceed, you don't want to take. You want to leave there a certain amount of water so the plant doesn't feel the stress or feel a certain level of stress. So again, it's a little bit complicated. Here's an example for grapevine. The soil texture, effective root depth, uh, water holding capacity, the management allowable depletion. Somehow you get some indication for the different crops and you can calculate what is the threshold that you don't want to exceed in terms of depletion? So you monitor ET every day, and when that ET reached 3.6 um, feet of water, it's actually probably inches of water, <laughs> it's not feet, <laughs> then you irrigate. Sorry, it's, it's probably uh, the, the units are wrong. But anyway, you irrigate. So it's another method for scattering irrigation. It's a little bit complicated because it requires, uh, uh, requires some um, more calculation. So what are the drawbacks? The disadvantage of ET scheduling is the, the, what you estimate is a crop water use might be for an area, but it could be different from what you have in your field. So now we have very site specific conditions, and so the risk is to over-irrigate or under-irrigate your crop because your estimate somehow has some uncertainties, okay? And that happens. And also there's another problem there, you know, that most of the crop coefficient information in California were developed for uh, infrequent irrigation, like surface, surface irrigation methods, or you run the surface irrigation every two weeks, or you refill the soil profile, or were run for, um, for spring clear irrigation, right? Now with micro-irrigation, everything changes because micro-irrigation really is a game changer. You spoon feed the crop continuously with water and nutrients. So that's a game changer. And so looking only at the crop ET might probably be a little bit limiting. And I always say you have to look at the plant and I have to look at the soil. So somehow you need a sense of what the plant feels and what the soil shows for doing a good job. I don't want to, to make this overcomplicated, but there's way to do it. Unless you measure your site-specific ET in your field, uh, and there's a way of doing like this Thule uh, ET uh, commercial station. Some people use a uh, thermometer. I've, I've heard people using a thermometer in avocado or citrus. So if you have a good sense of what is the amount, real amount of water used in your field specific condition, then you can do quite a good job. But if you estimate, somehow there are a lot of uncertainties. Soy moisture is the second alternative that you have over there. And what you do, you normally keep track of what happens in the soil. So the amount of water that is applied and the, water, uh, the, the amount of water that is uptaken by the plant. So, and it gives you information on how much water infiltrates during an irrigation, how much water is uptaken by the plant in between irrigation, and that's an important, uh, important information. We'll also give you information on how, how, what is the level somehow to maintain in order to have optimal growth or optimal uh, production, okay? There's a, uh, so with soy moisture monitoring, you know, you can uh, somehow help uh, answering the, these questions, when to start irrigation, uh, and over a certain, after a certain uh, number of hours, as enough water infiltrated where you want the water to be for your roots, all right? 
And uh, so, and then can also help you setting the irrigation timing uh, to apply enough. Uh, so the question is, uh, are we applying enough or we have to increase the number of hours or are we applying insufficient or excessive water? So all this is kind of important in your, in your situation. Also, it's important for some crop that there's a little bit of soil water reserve for when you cannot irrigate for some reason. Like uh, in that crop, you stop irrigation before harvest in order to uh, allow the, the machinery to enter the field. So you want the top level, uh, the top soil a little bit drier also to prevent some fungi and other diseases. So it's important to know what is available down there if the crop can still uh, evapotranspire at the desired level. Uh, soil moisture can be uh, measured in different way. Uh, soil moisture content is probably, uh, it, it could be in percentage or inches of water per foot of soil, or you can have soil moisture tension. This, to me, is more indicative of the energy, the tension. It gives you the, the, the centibars or the, the, the negative pressure that the plant feels when he has to pull out water. So to me, it's a little bit more intuitive to use the tension, so I have a sense of what is the energy that the plant has to deploy to pull out water. Okay, So there's a bunch of prod product in the market. There's a whole range of products. Some, some of them measure the soil water contents. Some of them measure the soil um, tension. But Anyway, they measure some properties and then they have some calibration coefficients, but yeah, you, you don't, you don't want to know how the sausage is made because there's too, it gets too complicated. And uh, uh, these are the classical old-fashioned uh, uh, watermarks that give you tension. They're very easy to deploy. Somehow they give a good indication. They are reliable within a certain range of condition. Uh, probably if you have a certain level of salinity, uh, it, it, might be, uh, it might be uncertain. So, but anyway, they are pretty reliable, they're durable, they require a little bit of maintenance, but not that much. But you got a lot of, lot of possibility on the market. So how do we schedule irrigation based on the soil moisture? Normally, we, we check what is in the soil, and we start irrigation when a certain level, when a certain threshold, it's reached and then we refill it. And we can choose to refill it to the top, to the, uh, to the level uh, of a maximum amount of water that can be stored or to do little irrigation. This is an example, a real example. We got uh, a watermark at 12 inches, 24 and 48. And you can see here where the, the water uptake by the roots happens is between 12 and 24 because the rest, uh, the 48 stay, let's say, relatively constant. At a certain point, it start getting low. So there's, there's a little bit of water uptake over there. Okay, so how do we install normally? This is a, just a sketch of, uh, that we prepare for Safari with Lynn. And so we have one a sensor at 12 inches, one sensor, one watermark at 24. We cannot install at 36 because there was a rock. And so the 12 and 24, so it depends on the situation, really. And in some, in some location, we find a rock, so we have to move a little bit away. But, you know, it really depends on the size-specific condition. And these are some recommended value for the threshold, that threshold of soy moisture. So if you have tension, so if you use a watermark or some of this sensor for the different type of soil, this is a very rough indication. These are the level that you don't want to exceed in terms of tension for the different type of soil because beyond that, you might, the plant might feel some stress, all right? But it really depends on the type, the different type of crop. And if, here is the somehow level that you don't want to exceed for when you measure the soil moisture content. But this, again, those are rough indications. This stuff has to be evaluated in your site specific condition. I don't want to overcomplicate, but it's really, if you want to do a good job, it's important that we know what you have there in terms of soil, where the roots are in order to place the. Uh, here is a, here is a two example from another project that I have. You see uh, a good, uh, um, good situation here. Uh, you know, you, you, you start seeing stress when he, you know, in this type of soil, I think it's a clay loam, you have beyond 80 or 90. So 
during the, the whole crop season, there's no problem. At a certain time, this is a pistachio orchard, at a certain time, the, the growers start drying out, so it doesn't apply water because he, ha he has to enter to the field with a shaker, right? Uh, here is another example of another pistachio orchard where you see there's a variation in the, in the top 18 inches, a little bit less in the 36 inches. So there are two examples, but if I stick only with the soil moisture and I don't observe the plant, so I run the risk of not getting a, a real sense of what is happening there. This soil is saline and sodic. So all this is showing well water condition, but when I measure the stem water potential, my plants here are stressed. So you can have stress even in well water condition or extremely well water condition or water access, the plant can feel the stress. And the stress might be given not by the soil water, by other components. So it's good to observe the plant in some way, all right? This plant had no stress even at, at, at higher level because it was a perfectly well-drained soil, no, so, no salt, no, no problem with sodium. Here it was saline sodic. And so it might be also confining layer or compaction layer, and so water piles up. And that's, you have asphyxia, hypoxia, fungi, a lot of problems. Even in well water, extremely well water conditions. So looking at the soil moisture, again, it's too limiting. <laughs> only. There's another problem with the, in, in drip irrigation and micro irrigation, you see there's sometimes this preferential flow, so the water doesn't get redistributed in the soil homogeneously. So if you happen to have your sensor in between this here, the sensor doesn't feel any water and say, hey, irrigate. Or if you, your sensor is here, okay, it'll feel the water, but the rest of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the soil is dry. So it happens. Also, you got cracking in some of the soil. So observing only the soil moisture is probably not the, the right way to go. But again, soil moisture can be used as a feedback information, okay? So we need to somehow look at a plant. How do we look at a plant? There are different, different ways of looking at the plant. There's a leaf or stem water potential. Again, probably is a, is a standard now, and it's labor intensive. There's also some automated sensor like the sap flow, or we can work with the canopy temperature, putting in a thermometer, pointing at the canopy. So those are, those are three different ways of looking at the, the plant, okay? And uh, pressure bombing, pressure chamber uh, uh, with leaf or stand water potential, a way of looking at what the plant feels in terms of water. Uh, it feels uh, okay, it feels happy or less happy, or it feels some kind of stress or deficit. Um, and there's a, a lot of work done by, by physiologists like uh, all the people that you have here from the university has done a lot of work to understand what are the, the boundary in terms of leaf water potential or stem water potential that will allow you to probably uh, reduce the excessive vegetative growth, but at the same time, not to lose photosynthesis, all right? So there's a piece of work conducted by, I think, Larry Williams again um, in, in grapes. And so there's a, there's a lot of information available. Other, other plant sensors are, for instance, the dendrometers. So those are measuring the shrinkage and the swelling. It's, there is some relation on what is the effort that the plant needs to deploy to pull out water. And this is somehow an indication of the, that effort. Ten minutes? Okay, I can make it. <laughs> and, um, and of course, there's a little bit of need for calibrating this sensor to your site-specific condition, to your crop. So those are still at the, some, some information is available for commercial settings, some other is not available. Here you got an infrared thermometer that I'm using for other research projects. I'm trying to correlate the temperature of the canopy with the stand water potential or the soil moisture, and it's not easy, and it depends on many different things. But anyway, you got this possibility also to, instead of measuring periodically and do a lot of work, to understand where is the level of stress in terms of the temperature. So when the, when the plant has some stress, it doesn't pull out water, it doesn't release the heat, so its, it's temperature becomes higher and higher and higher than the, the, the air temperature because it's not in balance with the atmosphere. So that's the principle. You got also some other probes. Those are the zinc probes and they feel the, the, the leaf 
uh, water status. And again, you need to somehow get a sense of how those parameters are correlated with each other. So we, we're doing some work on, uh, on this uh, sensor to correlate with the stem water potential or leaf water potential to see can we use this in the future without having to go every two days or three days to the field, can we use this for automatically monitoring what the plant feels and irrigate at certain level? So there's, a still, there's still some research work to be done. What I think is really needed, um, it's a combination of the three methods. So I would start, if I had to decide when to irrigate, I would observe the plant first and say this is the, and decide when is the right timing for irrigate. How much should be we irrigating? Then I will use some kind of uh, ET based for the amount of water that I have to apply. And then I will check the soil as a feedback, okay? And, I, uh, and, and this could be easily <coughs> tested very quickly in three, four, five irrigation. And so you can get a sense of what is really needed in your, in your situation. And the feedback will come from soil, but also from the flow meter and say, how much water I applied in three hours? Because most of the people say, oh, I applied three hours. But yeah, but how much water was that? Three hours today and three hours in a month might be somehow different in terms of water apply. So again, I would use for the proper t timing, some kind of plant-based measurement for the identify when to irrigate. The amount of water should come with what has the plant used since I irrigated the last time. So you can apply that amount or a part of that amount, depending on the strategy that you want to feel, that you want to follow. And then I'll check on the soil, is this enough for me to survive, for the plant to survive for the next week or the next two weeks? And also I'll get a feedback on how many uh, cubic um, feet or how many gallons uh, uh, I applied to reach this, this uh, uh, good level of soil. But again, these are tools and methods. I think before you use any tools or method, you have to decide somehow what is your strategy? What are you going to follow in terms of do you want to fully irrigate your crop in order not to have any stress. And this is a situation for some crops and some areas in California for a grapevine, like you know, some, some of the area. Or you want to have some partial or some, some moderate level of stress that you want to follow in specific time of the... So before deciding what tool to use and what irrigation method, I think it's very important to decide you know, what strategy you're going to follow. Take home message, I'm almost done. So define your irrigation strategy based on the target of yield, production, and quality, whether you're going to be rewarded for that yield or not. Because there are areas in California where grape growers, either they produce a certain bricks or a, a, you know, higher bricks, no matter, you know, the, the, the market will pay the same amount. So probably there's no need for all this kind of sophistication. You just want to irrigate at, uh, in order to maximize the yield. So the economics of this is important. Uh, Site-specific condition, now with micro-irrigation, everything is a little bit more complicated because we don't have an homogeneous amount of water that gets redistributed through. And also, as I explained yesterday, most of the new development are happening in marginal soils or soils that are not homogeneous. And so there's a lot of special variability there. And so this is another consideration. So the soil that we have, the water supply might be good or might be less good, or you might alternate groundwater with, with uh, surface water and the other aspect that you have, the slope or you know, the, the labor availability. So you're going to be automating the irrigation or you're going to have people checking in the field whether everything worked out very well or not. So it's, it, there's a other consideration. So once you decide the strategy you're going to follow, it doesn't take much to learn how to follow that strategy. So you got you to gotta select what parameter you want to target and what parameter you want to monitor. It could be ET, it could be the soil, it could be the plant, or a combination of the three, which I, uh, I would recommend. 
And then schedule the irrigation according to your strategy and get a feedback. The feedback is very important because, you know, you, you say, oh, this needs three hours. And then in three hours, you know, two hours, you didn't irrigate well because it was a clogging or there was uh, some kind of leak. And so you didn't have enough pressure over there. So there's something that, that might happen. And again, because we have a lot of weather variability, you don't rely only on your experience because, you know, there's, during the crop season, there's so many things that can happen. You know, power failure, uh, irrigation system is not performing well for some reason. Groundwater level drops down, so you don't have the pressure that you, so don't rely only on your capacity uh, uh, or, or experience from the past. And be prepared that, you know, things are uh, becoming a little bit more sophisticated as the time goes. I'll stop here. I wanted to keep it general, but I'll be happy to answer any question. Um, and, um, uh, and I'll stick around also uh, for lunch and after lunch in case you need some, some more detailed information. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah, that's one way. Sometimes the plant gets disconnected also from the environment <laughs> for some reason, and some of the crops get, uh, you know, decoupled from what happens around it. So uh, this, is a, this is a complicated question to answer. <laughs> but I would say yes, in general, test and, and see where I go with, you know, applying different amount and somehow set my, my target. But I'll also keep observing after the target is set whether that kind of a thinking works with your plant in your, because the soil might make a lot of difference. The rootstock might make a lot of difference. So really, there's no recipe, general recipe. But in, in general, yes, I would observe the plant and see, am I doing right? Am I doing right over the course of the crop season? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, there's a there's a lot of lot of information that is available out there. Probably there's people that are more qualified than me, like Khan and Dr. Williams, to answer that question. Uh, yes, but you know it really depends on many other factors. Yeah, so I would say uh, there are different stages where you have to be very careful. Yeah, um, but again, I don't feel very qualified to. Uh, answer that question. I might give misleading information. So I'll let Khan and, and Dr. Williams to, to uh, answer. Yeah. 